This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 305. Hi, I'm Brian J. Jones, the author of Becoming Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, and the Making of American Imagination. Stretch your imagination each time you listen to this. It's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. Hi, and welcome once again to the Read to Lead podcast. My name is Jeff, and this is the podcast that I've dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I believe that if you want to achieve true success in your business and in your life, then you need to be a lifelong learner. And to do that, at least one of the best ways I know of, is to be an intentional and consistent reader. I've designed the podcast to help you not only narrow your reading list, but bring you key insights and valuable ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors in a relatively small package. Today, we are joined by Dr. Eric George, author of the book, We Ditch the Me Mindset and Change the World. I'll be asking Dr. George to share how to spot the manifestation of the me mindset in your work and life, the idea of connectedness and its power to transform lives. We'll explore the possibilities of connectedness by examining its six fundamental outcomes and much, much more. The people we encounter, Dr. George says, represents the source of a fulfilling life. And through a series of compelling anecdotes and observations, He takes us on a journey to one by one reveal these six key outcomes of his timeless philosophy. Dr. Eric George is a renowned hand surgeon, serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and philanthropist. He is the founder and CEO of Omega Hospital, New Orleans' first physician-owned hospital, the Hand Center of Louisiana, where he actively practices, and ERG Enterprises, a $1 billion investment firm committed to changing communities worldwide. Well, in addition to practicing medicine full-time, uh, Dr. George owns and operates uh, businesses in numerous industries. He also serves on uh, numerous civic, charitable, and educational boards and contributes to a number of awesome uh, causes. He's written his first book. That's why he's here with us today. It's called We Ditch the Me Mindset and Change the World. I loved this book. Dr. George, a.k.a. Eric, welcome uh, to the Read to Lead podcast. It's a delight to have you here. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Jeff. I'm, I've been an avid listener of you, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to tell you a little bit more about my book. Tremendous. Well, this book was an easy read for me, an enjoyable read. I really appreciated uh, Eric's uh, stories that helped drive many of the points home. It's eight uh, relatively short chapters. Each chapter is about nine or ten pages. And, and my questions, uh, as it turns out, there's, there's, there's essentially, uh, Eric, a, a question per chapter that I want to dig into, uh, starting with how have you seen a me-focused mindset manifest itself in, in the two very different worlds that you spend a lot of time in, you know, with patients one-on-one, and then also w- with business owners and entrepreneurs? I I think that is a great question. And, you know, the me mindset clearly in medicine, I think, and, you know, as you say, the two worlds for me is the entrepreneurial world and the medical world. And the me mindset in the medical world is when someone doesn't face the reality of a disease that may be affecting them, whether it's cancer, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's trauma, you name that condition. And I think, Everyone in your audience that's listening would know that one person can't be an island in that. You need health care. You need family members to get you to the appointments. You need nursing staffs. You need assistants. You need walkers. You need therapists. You need meetings. Mm. And the me focus of the sick patient is a guaranteed failure in health. In business, what I have found in that crowd is that kind of person who feels like, I believe I'm the smartest one in the room. Mm. They end up controlling everything, performing every task, making every decision, which kind of chokes the life out of the organization over time. Don't you agree? Yeah, that's sort of that mindset of, you know, nobody can do it as well as I can do it anyway. So why why try? I'm just going to do everything. I, I'm, a, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Uh, and so that's <laughs> that's something that I've had to work on for quite some time is bringing other people into the equation and not trying to just do everything on my own. Well, 
well, you know what I found? And I, I, I would say that in medicine, you tend to stay that way at the beginning. You see very, very focused on saying, well, I have to create my craft and be that one person. But I think you realize, and as you have, that there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so much that you can do. And you really need to be comfortable with giving people some more authority, listening to their ideas. And I find they become much more interested in being part of your business instead of them being an employee of your business. Mm. They feel like you're really part of that network and they are part of that business. Mm. Well, part of my work the last year, Eric, has taken me to working with service providers and physicians primarily, helping them launch video channels, audio channels, things like podcasts to help grow and and market their businesses. And I find that because so much of them have been in the insurance-based world, and many of these doctors are people moving to cash-based practices and firing the insurance companies, or as they like to call them, their pimp sometimes. (laughs) I'm finding that many of them struggle with running a business because that's something they've never had to do before. And so admittedly, When your book was first pitched to me, I thought to myself, what could I learn from a doctor about business? And boy, was I wrong. I could could learn a lot from you as it has to do with with business. Uh, And that was a a pleasant uh, surprise. Uh, Share a bit, if you would, about the central focus of this book, this idea of connectedness and, and its power, you say, to transform lives. Well, and and thank you for your kind words about the business in medicine. And just to go back to your question on that, I have to tell you that your colleagues and friends in that world, and that may have been what forced me to have to learn the system because dealing with a high volume of patients and dealing with the insurance industries and reimbursement really forces you to kind of learn that system or you will perish. What I found in the mindset of the we mindset, it's really about approaching life with pretty much an insatiable desire to become more connected to the people and the opportunity that surround us. Mm. You know, when we look into this mindset, we believe that other people's ideas, perspectives give us strength. And by embracing them, we create the life we want for ourselves and others. In other words, A person like you knows far more than I would ever know about radio and radio worlds. (laughs) And so if our entity was interested in looking at radio stations or podcast networks, we would reach out to a Jeff Brown and say, tell us what you know, Mm. teach us about this and come on board with us. And let's let's either acquire this radio or help us start this podcast. And that's kind of the mindset that's played out for me in the we mindset. Yeah, it's it's been eye opening to me uh, to really think about you know what opportunities have I uh, missed because I don't have that kind that level of an open mind or open mindedness. And so it was it was it was sort of a, a, a challenge to me to really think more readily about you know, what opportunities I might be missing out on because I'm not thinking that way. So I appreciated that certainly about, about the book. Uh, the bulk of, of, of Dr. George's book, um, Eric, sorry, explores uh, the possibilities of, of connectedness by examining what he calls six fundamental outcomes. We've danced around a couple of these, but let's dive in, Eric, to some of these one by one, starting with, with purpose. Talk about your experience with purpose, or in, in your case, uh, multiple purposes. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And, and I really did have, I'd, I'd like to just digress real quick and say, I have, I'm in a very unique position as a hand surgeon. Mm. In a typical hand practice, we'll see a high volume of patients for a short period of time. But typically, I mean, we looked at it when we wrote the book and I was seeing about 200 to 250 people of those maybe 30 or 40 a week or new people. And when you meet that many new people, it's fascinating to me just in the first couple minutes of the introduction. You come in and you've squished your finger doing a project outside. And I say, well, Jeff, nice to meet you. Tell me about yourself. And that gave me the kind of open mind to listen to the injury. But I also am very fascinated with what they do and how they got to where they are. For me, the purpose 
was when we embrace the mindset, we discover our purpose, where we should really concentrate our time. Like for me, introducing me to medicine and then investing in things that were similar to medicine kind of led me to other business activities. But that purpose of the particular business was the number one for me and said, okay, What are we going to do? Build a better mousetrap as an ambulatory surgery center? Are we going to try to figure out where the inefficiencies in a hospital are? And then it dovetailed hospitals and hospitality tend to really be very similar. Mm. And that's what led us into that purpose as well. Mm. Well, partnerships, that's the second of the six uh, fundamental outcomes highlighted in the book. Eric says is a prerequisite to living a fulfilling life. Why do you believe, Eric, that partnerships uh, are a prerequisite to living a fulfilling life? I think unequivocally that is probably the best advice that uh, or a pearl that has worked well for me. Mm. And that is... When you are involved in several different things in your life, if you're doing practicing medicine in the day or doing surgery and running a business, or if you're a hotelier or a podcaster and you decide to venture into something else, I think finding that right person and that right organization helps you to develop and to nurture a relationship, which has brought me incredible partners. They've provided us with great expertise in numerous industries. And also they kind of help to allow you to form a more lean operation Mm. because you have someone, if you're willing to believe them and listen to them and use their years of experience I think it can really help you to have a great relationship with people that you really care about. And you learn as you go with those people that are specialists in that world. Well, something that um, Eric reveals pretty openly in the book is his experience with perseverance. Eric, I was fascinated by the story of the lawsuit brought on by some of the early staff at Omega, I think it was, uh, particularly the outcome. Uh, You hired some very smart lawyers (laughs) throughout that (laughs) process. Um, uh, Share about that to the extent you're comfortable here. uh, And how did you manage to persevere through that? Oh, oh, my friend, I'm very comfortable sharing the whole story of that. And I know your listeners are very civilized and they've all been in business and they all know that in any business, the legal avenues are something that you have to you prepare for when you start the business by lawyering up and papering the deal and then you paper it as you go. I would tell you probably the one of the toughest lessons I learned was a wise attorney who's now retired said to me, he said, Dr. George, you're going to learn that when people do very badly in a business, we all know those people sue. When businesses are barely getting by for both people, rarely anyone sues. But he said the one thing that people forget, and that is when a business is doing remarkable and I mean, at this time, we it was 2006, we had a hospital with 12 or 15 physicians. And, and, and Jeff, I think we distributed $36 million in 18 months. I mean, it was really booming. Mm. And I didn't realize that people, when businesses are doing great, greed becomes the number one uh, battle that I fought with. And It took some really great advice and it kind of puts me back to the we. I reached out to some attorneys. They became not only my attorney, but my friends. And they said, listen, you're in for a tough fight and you need to stay in because you didn't do anything. And this is what happens when things become very, very, very lucrative. And I I hope the story tells you more a lot. I was trying to reflect that. Don't give up on something that you believe in Mm. and fight for what's important. And that's where I think I really connected and needed a lot of support from partners, business associates and attorneys. Well, related to uh, support, some of these 
fundamental outcomes kind of dovetail into and out of one another. One of my favorite quotes from the book, Eric, says that uh, success in life requires great individual accomplishment, yet no achievement comes without help and support of a team working together. Support, as you might have guessed, is the fourth of these six outcomes. You thought they all started with a P, but throwing a curve here at you, this one does not. Uh, Eric, talk, talk about delegating responsibilities and relinquishing control, two of several ways we can invite support. In other words, we, we touched on this a moment ago, but I'd love for you to, to share some more experiences. Well, I, I think delegating control and looking for support from others really accomplishes, you know, I think every entrepreneur, every CEO fears, where do you draw that line? Where do you say, okay, you have the authority to do this. I need to know about this before you do it. I think we all ask ourselves that question. And I think what I have learned is if you truly empower these people that are your support staff and those people make a mistake along the way, but feel like they don't have to run to you on every problem. And yes, they will make a mistake. They will do something that you may say, gosh, I wouldn't have handled it that way. But I think if they feel that autonomy of being part of your network and literally having the authority to make those decisions, you don't run into all those business problems that I hear many of my colleagues tell me, and that is going on to the next job because the pay is a little bit better Mm. or picking something else because there's a 401k with this job and not with the other one. They feel like they're really part of the family and we make them that. We give them equity in our deals. We we empower them to take charge and we ask them to really be a support. And they've been a great support for me. And I, I count on them every day in every business that I have. Well, I want to transition now, Eric, to perspective. Eric contributes his success as an entrepreneur, he says, in healthcare to his ability to relate to his patients and their experience. And as I read the book and some of Eric's stories, I I couldn't help but think, gee, I wish every doctor (laughs) related to patients the way Eric does, truly. Uh, Talk, Eric, about how perspective contributes to a more complete, fulfilling life if we can attain it. Well, you know, I think that all of us have had an experience with a physician. I did a my fellowship in Arizona through the Mayo Clinic system, and one of the wisest and one of the brightest, I would say, a mentor for me said that every patient knows what's wrong with them. They just don't know what it's called or know what to do about it. It's your job to figure out what it is. What he's basically saying is a patient comes in and says, hey, I have this clicking in my wrist or, hey, I have this terrible headache. They don't know what the problem is. That's our job to know what that problem is and how to remedy it. But the only way to learn that problem is to listen to the patient. Mm. And we all agree the best doctors are the ones who will listen to you. And it made for a very successful medical practice for me to hear you say, Jeff, this is my problem. If you were my patient, you'd say my thumb, index, and long finger are going numb at night. And I would listen and adhere to what the problem was. So I dovetailed that into business. And I said to the same situation, Well, tell me what the problem is with this hospital. Tell me what the problem is with this startup. And that has allowed me to hear the problem and then use a team of people to help solve it. And it's been a it's been very it's been very good to me. And the people around me have been wonderful. I was drawn in uh, in this particular uh, chapter uh, by how you approached helping some of your patients who might come in with a you know, a, a traumatic injury and thinking that, you know, their life is never going to be the same and, and, and helping them to look at that from a different perspective and realize that while things may be bad today, they don't necessarily have to stay that way. A- absolutely. I, I have to tell you, in many of those stories came from just years. I've been in practice 27 years and I had a patient who I still think of today who had was injured and ended up with basically two arms that were basically unable to be used. Mm. And of course, most of us would say, well, if you're disabled by two arms, 
how would you ever live a life of purpose or meaning? This patient today is still one of the top dispatchers uh, in, in, he's not in this state anymore, but he's a dispatcher. He uses headsets. He's loved by the community and he's learned to work himself through many, 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 as you would think, challenges mm. and has a fulfilling life and works very hard and loves his job. And when you can see a guy who loses both arms can work and laugh and enjoy life, I think you can sure learn with patients who have challenges that they face at the time that doesn't necessarily mean life is over. It just means life may take you in a different direction. Mm, love that. How we respond to life, I think, determines our, our path. We, we have a choice. You know, I mean, I can choose today to be happy or I can choose to be ticked off about everything. That, <laughs> that, I mean, it's really up to me. And I think a lot of people lose, lose sight of that. Um, well, we've covered five of these six. One, one, the, the last one is trust. What do you mean when you say the most successful people in life inspire others to trust them while actively looking for people to trust in return? Well, I think if you embrace we, you foster trust with others in business. And I'm, I'm not sure if there's anything more valuable than trust. From perspective of leaders and op- entrepreneurs, this mindset is crucial really in two ways in my mind. Number one, it allows you to optimize your performance as a leader because leadership requires you to think we and not me. And I think most important, it creates a culture that values the we mentality, promotes it and actively engages in it. Your customers, your partners, all your stockholders see the benefits, as does your bottom line when you truly exhibit trust. And that is saying, hey, I can't be down here to count out the register in every single project. Mm -hmm. I cannot be available to you to assume that you're going to do these things for us. And I think that is what makes a great company. And I think it's I'm hopeful is what makes a good leader. And I think if you can show someone that you trust them and, and you and they feel that sense of value Fortunately for me, I have never been burned by dishonesty. Uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking of last week's guest on the podcast, Tom Rath, who wrote Strengths Finder and How Full Is Your Bucket, books like that sure. that you may be familiar with. And uh, something he said that uh, in the book that, I, that stuck with me is the key to living a meaningful life is to invest more time where your talents will yield the greatest return for others. And, oh. and I, th- I think that dovetails nicely uh, with what you're saying. Well, that is great. And I absolutely agree with that. That that is so true. And I think when the we people that have worked that you've trusted Mm. and something opens or you have a celebration or a new we you meet a particular goal, never do you see more of your employees happy and euphoric about it than if they've been the trusted partner in the deal versus the old me mindset corporation where the um, leader CEO steps up and tells everyone what he's done. I think you feel the grumble in the boardroom of saying what he did. What about me? I was the one that was down there designing the room. (laughs) Or what about me that did all the accounting? And I think when when everyone feels like they were part of the rowing team and you hit the finish line, everyone celebrates and senses that same sense of joy. I really feel just like as you reflected in the year the last podcast, that that's the that's the best thing in life. Mm. Well, Eric, I got a couple of questions I want to ask, not directly related to the book. Before I jump into those, though, is there anything else from the book you want to make sure we know or or walk away with? Well, maybe one thing, and I think you touched on it. We really tried to make the book a very quick read. Each chapter is nine or 10 pages. I'm very keenly aware today that there's so much time in the day and there's so many opportunities with things to hear, listen, see, and do. And so what we tried to do was just tell a little bit of our story 
and maybe offer a different way to look at things. And I think today we all know if any time we need a little more we and a little less me, the society today is tending to lean more towards the me with some of the politics and the fighting that we see. And I was hoping that maybe some would see that you can do okay as a group and you don't have to be the the sole proprietor of many different adventures. And you touched on that and I appreciate that. Well, I want you to uh, put your thinking cap on, if you will, and think back to the last few years or maybe over the course of your career even to the books that have had the biggest impact on you, this being the Read to Lead podcast. I'd love to know uh, what what books have impacted you the most and and maybe if you can share why or how those those books uh, impacted you. Well, I will tell you in the, you know, in the business world recently, probably the two that I've really enjoyed is the the E-Myth. I think Michael Gerber wrote that. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. I like The Goal by Elk Goldratt. And I thought both of those books really shared a lot of messages that I thought were really crucial. The E-Myth was really about the common myth of being an entrepreneur, which is when you work for yourself, right? And you set your own schedule and have freedom. And it's a myth because most business owners are constrained by that business that they start. Mm. And that's where I feel like we could jump in and say, hey, you can be constrained if you take it all, but if you share it with other people, it wouldn't take as much from you. The goal, I think this book's absolutely the theory of constraints used in manufacturing. I thought it was really a fantastic story, particularly how he engaged everyone. I thought it was pretty easy to read. I love the stories and the teaching. So, Mm. Those two were probably the most influential to me in business. Probably House of God as a medical person was a back back many years ago. It's a great book about starting residency and how to handle adversity. One of the greatest lines from House of God is you have to be Teflon. So you you have to get up and go every day. You Mm. can't let things stick to you or you'll collapse. (laughs) So those would be three great books for me. Well, one trait, one skill I think every leader needs is the skill of effective idea sharing, a.k.a. public speaking. So I'd be curious to know, in your mind, Eric, what are some of your best practices, uh, if you will, for delivering an impactful and memorable public talk? Wow, Jeff, that's a great question. I really like that. And I'll tell you, when I give a speech or give a talk, what I have found is if you go down bullet point after bullet point, your audience gets a little bit sleepy. (laughs) And I read an article once, and I don't know if it's true, but it says in the average person, your attention span, your truly focused looking at attention span is about four to six minutes. And then you've moved on with your brain and your thought. And I have found that sharing stories are much more effective with a message than just the message. So when I give a talk, I think everyone's either had an experience in healthcare or I'll tell a story about my childhood days with my growing up in West Virginia, or I'll talk about a patient that I recalled or a surgery. I also think that people like to hear things that they didn't do well in, things that they've made mistakes along the way. And I know when I hear someone give a speech, I really like them when they become much more personal and say, well, let me tell you, I was young in those days. This is what I did. And looking back, that's not what I would do again. But I think sharing your heart, sharing how you feel about situations or what make a great keynote address. Of course, you need to have some inflection. You have to be able to go up and down in the way you present. But I think you were talking more material. And I think telling stories is much more compassionate for people to hear. And I think people want to hear compassionate and and humble people tell stories about how they got to where they are. Mm. Well, finally, uh, Eric, what's coming up next uh, for you and your team that you're excited about and and also able to talk about at this point? 
Sure. Well, thank you very much. Well, we've been really actively involved. We're pioneering some innovative approach to some commercial real estate and hospitality. And I can sure share that. You know, I've been fortunate enough in that I have a lot of hotel properties. And as many of you know, if you have young children or you have college age, there's the new Airbnb concept or Sonder concept. And that's where People are looking to find spaces to stay in that are a little different than hotels, places they can bring families, groups of families, pets in neighborhoods. So we've been working on a kind of hospitality development that focuses on multifamily. We also work a lot in historic preservation. We've done a lot of projects, apartment buildings, some food courts, and we've had an opportunity to do a public TV documentary with Lawrence Fishburne on some historic preservation that'll be on public television in the next couple months. Mm. Probably the most exciting for me, Jeff, is I really like these startups. There are some of the brightest young people out there with some of the most incredible ideas that if we can get those to the at least to the beginning of the line or midway through the finish line, some of these technology things that are out there, I'm just fascinated with. I'm actively involved with a company now that's developed needless technology for vaccinations. Amen. And it's amazing. And they're eradicating, yeah, polio worldwide. And, you know, one of the biggest difficulties is sticking people and getting stuck in people's fears of getting a needle stuck. And um, needleless technology, I think, is fascinating. And we've got the World Health Organization supporting us. So some of the newer technologies, I think, are going to change lives for everybody. And I really enjoy that part of the business world. Well, my miniature dachshund, Frank, who gets two insulin shots a day, just said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's really great. There's a company called Hemisphere Technology that's working on the first tablet, the pill for diabetes. And if that works, that'll really change lives for many people, including your little dachshund who's <laughs> having to do needle sticks and... <laughs> I hope yeah. we can change that for your yeah. little what's his name? Frank. You said what's yeah. his name? Yeah, we got Frank, Fritz, and Charlie. I love that. <laughs> They're great, aren't they? They're awesome. They're awesome. Well, the book again uh, is called "We Ditch the Me Mindset and Change the World." His name is Doctor Eric George, or once you get to know him. Just Eric. That works, too. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for uh, being a part of the Read to Lead podcast and coming on the show today. I really had a great time talking to you and loved your book. Jeff, that means so much to me coming from you, especially someone that has a reputation such as yourself. And I'm very honored, and I, I want to thank you and your listeners for giving me the opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, I think you'll find that reading this book will open your eyes to potential opportunities you're missing to develop deeper relationships with those around you, those who you might just meet in passing, but who may have much, much more to offer to life, a more fulfilling life, as Dr. George likes to say. I'm sorry, as Eric likes to say. More on this episode on the show notes page we've created just for it. You'll find that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 305 for episode 305. You can leave comments there on the post to let me know what you think about the podcast and the episode, or you can write me directly, jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. I love to read your questions, comments, suggestions, or feedback. Again, that's jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. If you're looking for someone to visit your organization or event to speak on leadership, personal growth and development and success, consider yours truly. You can reach out to me about that opportunity at that same email address. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 